Hello and welcome to A Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome to anyone who's found us for the first time. It's no accident that you're here today, friends, so please don't run off quite yet. Please stick around for a bit and let's see what the Lord has for us today. And welcome back to all you regular listeners. I'm so thankful for you. Thank you for coming back another day. Thank you for coming on this journey with me and thinking about God's Word each day. And I know uh, there are some of you that listen just about every day. There are some that listen here and there, and that is okay. In whatever way God chooses to use this, may be he may he be glorified. May we draw closer to him and seek him more and learn more of him and know more of him and hide his word in our hearts. I want you to know that I continue to pray for you regularly, that he will draw you closer to him and give you more of a desire to know him and to know his word and that you will be very intentional and deliberate about spending time with him that you will make those appointments to spend time with him throughout the day. Oh, friends, we must. And can I just encourage you to keep running that race with perseverance, keep uh, enduring, and um, make the time. You have time. Uh, Sometimes and often we must deny self. We must uh, deny what we think we want to do that will be um, more immediately self-satisfying and self-gratifying, but therein lies the problem. We must deny ourselves, pick up our cross daily and follow him. And and it's for our good and his glory. You know, the world, that old devil will say, well, you're denying yourself and um, it's just going to be uh, bad for you. But no, if we follow God's framework, God's plan, the world won't understand it, but he does it and it's good for us. And so I just want to encourage you, spend time with him, memorize his word, read his word, study his word, live it out and share it. Uh, Please do consider sharing this podcast with your friends, family, neighbors, strangers, just anyone who you think may receive a blessing from it, and know that I love to hear from you. So if you feel so led, send me a message sometime. Let me know what the Lord's doing in your life as you're uh, spending more time in His Word. Well, our verse for the day for, what is today? Um... September the 28th, 2024. Can you believe we're almost at the end of September? Um, Comes from the Gospel of Matthew again. Matthew chapter 9, verse 28, and it reads as follows from the Legacy Standard Bible. And when he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Oh, friends, I love this story. And, you know, I love what God's reminding us. He's doing it over and over again in the verses that we've been in in different places. And um, we see it so much in Jesus's life about uh, belief about the importance of where do we put our faith. And, you know, I've talked to you before, I believe, maybe the last time we were uh, in Matthew, or it could have just been a few days ago. They all start to run together, but it's a common theme um, that when we think of faith, we should also think of belief, and those things are interchangeable. It's where do we put our trust Um, and Uh, faith and belief can very much be interchangeable. And in the precept studies, the Bible studies that um, I'm blessed to do with some dear Bible study sisters that we've done for, uh, goodness, maybe nearly five years, I think, uh, if not longer, um, when we mark those words, faith and belief, we mark them identically. And it really helps to think about that. So when you talk about believing, that's also about faith. And when we talk about faith, it's it's what, what do we believe? Where do we put our hope? Where do we put our trust? And so I'm excited for us to park here today. Uh, remember, it has always ever been about the heart with God. Um, we see that from the beginning. Do you believe God's word? Or man's word? 
Do you walk by what you know is true based on the authority, the one true living God? Um, Do you walk by that or do you walk by the shifting sands of man's wisdom and man's uh, so-called authority, which he doesn't have? Any authority that anyone has is only given by God, but you can't do it on your own. And it all boils down to, do we take God's word over man's word or man's word over God's word? It's very simple. It's the, it's that with um, in all the issues that we see in the culture, all the issues we see in politics, all the issues we see in education and all these things. Do we take God's word as foundational? Do we take man's word as foundational? And you have to come to grips with that, friend. If you don't get it um, and get it right now, you will get it right on that day of judgment. But it may be too late. All right. Well, we are back in Matthew's gospel. We've uh, been in the gospels quite a bit the last few days. And Lord willing, we will be there again tomorrow in in, uh, Mark's gospel, if the Lord allows And we know that these Gospels are in the New Testament. The four Gospels begin the New Testament, and they're written by four different men with four different backgrounds from four different, with four different writing styles. We've talked about this a lot. Two of the men were in that original apostle group with the Lord Jesus, and two were not. They received their information from those men who were, and um, I love it that we see those different styles. Matthew's gospel, the one we're in today, is the longest of the four gospels, being 28 chapters long. And we know that Matthew was a tax collector. And in this chapter 9 that we find ourselves in, in his gospel, um, we read about his calling when he was sitting in the tax booth and the Lord Jesus came by and said, follow me. And he picked up and followed him. And we see that right after that, Jesus uh, went to Matthew's house. Matthew had a banquet or a dinner, and he invited other tax collectors and sinners, and the Pharisees didn't uh, like it. They couldn't understand why Jesus would want to dine with those tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus told them that he didn't come for the righteous. He did not come to call the righteous because he knew none of us were righteous friends, Uh, but he came to call sinners. So there was that uh, call available for everyone who would heed it, everyone who would listen. And it's still that way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we have to know, we have to believe that what God has said is true, that none of us is righteous. No, not one. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but he sent his son Jesus to pay the penalty that we owed. That is the truth. And so um, Jesus was telling them, you know, that he came for sinners. And Matthew was... um, as I mentioned, a tax collector, but we see that it seemed that his primary audience, when he was inspired to write this uh, gospel by the Holy Spirit, seemed to be his fellow Jews. He wanted them to know how important it was that um, the one they had been looking for was there. Jesus had come. Jesus was that long-awaited Messiah. And we see that he uses, I believe it's over 60 Old Testament references within his gospel um, of things that uh, the practicing Jews would have known, they would have recognized. And Matthew was showing how Jesus Jesus had fulfilled each one of those. And Matthew often talked about how the kingdom of heaven was near or the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And he um, just continued to give just example and proof and after proof after proof that Jesus was this one. And so he also records, though, how the many of his fellow Jews and the religious leaders and the Pharisees um, did not believe And we see that. We've seen that in all of the Gospels. We talked about it um, yesterday. We talked about when Paul realized about how he was, uh, even though he was a Pharisee and a very religious Jew, uh, when he realized that Jesus was that Messiah. And we talked about, um, let's see, what was it? 
uh, two days ago, how he had such anguish in his heart and grief in his heart over his fellow Jews who, who didn't believe, even though they had been given all that they needed to believe. And so we, we see that throughout Matthew's gospel. But up until this point, you know, at the very beginning of Matthew's gospel, he starts with the genealogy and then he gives us, um, uh, more of the information surrounding Jesus's birth. And then we see, uh, about Jesus's baptism and about John the Baptist and uh, about Jesus's temptation and the wilderness and uh, then Jesus's ministry beginning. And we see just in the chapter right before this chapter, Jesus's uh, power over the spiritual realm where he cast out demons, his power over the natural realm where he uh, was able to calm the storm and his uh, power over the physical realm where when when I talk about that I mean the people's physical uh, state where he healed uh, diseases and that sort of thing and uh, we'll see that throughout his gospel Matthew's gospel um, like Luke and Mark's gospel have the parables in it but John's gospel does not and I love that the Lord would give us all of these uh four different gospels from four different men um, so we could put these uh, together and get more of a picture of what it was like when Jesus was there. Uh, But as we talked about when we were in John's gospel and as we talked about when uh, when we talked about the Apostle Paul, uh, those religious leaders, many of them were against Jesus because they could not come to grips with the fact that God had sent him and that God had given him authority and that he was equal with God the Father. Um, but you may recall, and because we've talked about it before, when we were in this, uh, chapter just about, what was it, seven, no, six days ago, uh, that we were talking more about healings and, um, Jesus had healed a paralytic, uh, that we have the account of how he'd healed a paralytic at the beginning of chapter nine. And, um, then we see in the middle of chapter nine that that synagogue ruler had come to Jesus and asked him to heal his daughter. And then the lady who had had the, uh, the hemorrhage for 12 years just wanted to touch the hem of his garment and she was saved. And so I love that, but I'm going to back up and get to where we are we'll see another episode of healing again and so I'm going to back up here to chapter 9 verse 18 and read forward so it's so important for you to get this context and for as we study to think about the other things that have been going on because people were seeing this people were um In this case, their faith was able to become sight. You know, sometimes we don't get to see that on this side of the cross. Uh, Sometimes we do. But at that time, God had uh, ordained and purposed that, yes, people could see these miracles. And it was helpful uh, for those others who would believe. And so I love that. But Look right here in chapter 9 of Matthew, verse 18. It says, while he, and that's Jesus, was saying these things to them. And what it was talking about is he had been talking uh, with some of John's disciples came, and they weren't sure why um, he, uh, why his disciples didn't fast uh, like like other people did. And Jesus was telling them, you, and I'm paraphrasing this, The attendants of the bridegroom don't fast while he is with them. They mourn after he's gone away. And uh, he was alluding to the fact that he was that one, that bridegroom. And while he was there, uh, they didn't need to fast. But when he went away, they would. And so um, that was part of what he was talking about. And it says, while he was saying these things to them, behold, a synagogue official came and was bowing down before him and said, my daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be saved from this. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has saved you. At once the woman was saved from her hemorrhage. We did a podcast on that. And when Jesus came into the official's house, that one, that synagogue official that was at the beginning of this section, and saw the flute players in the crowd in noisy disorder, he was saying, leave, 
for the girl has not died but is asleep, and they began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, coming in, he took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And this news spread throughout all the land. And as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And here's our verse. And when he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. And I'm going to read right past it. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout all the land. So just backing up and kind of looking at this um, and then zooming back down, everywhere Jesus had been going, As we know, he had been healing diseases and afflictions and casting out demons, and um, his presence was felt. They knew that he was doing something extraordinary. (laughs) And so uh, we see that as he had left, you know, where he had taken, uh, had raised this young child, had healed this woman with this affliction, and then even before that had done all these things, um, and all this news had been going out about him, um, as he was leaving there, two blind men came to him, it says. It says, two blind men followed him, crying out, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, I just have to stop. This is right before our verse for the day, but this is where it is important to slow down because when you read that first, you're like, okay, there's two blind men coming after Jesus. But do you hear how that sounds? There are two blind men following Jesus. So how how did they do it? Did they do it by voice? Did they do it by crowd? Did they have uh did they hear that a crowd was going after him? Did they have people who uh like the friends who lowered the man down from the rooftop just brought them to Jesus or um how did they follow him? We don't know that. It doesn't tell us. But then it gets even more interesting because in our verse for the day, it says, and when he entered the house, the blind men came up to him. So they kept groping. If they couldn't see, then they were they were um, still going after him because they knew there was something in him. When you think about that, Jesus is the light of the world. And the darkness could not overcome it. Um, And so even though these men were uh, caught in probably both spiritual and physical darkness, because all of us, uh, as we've talked about before, until we believe, um, are blinded to the truth. All of us are in that spiritual darkness and are spiritually blind until he opens our eyes and we can see. Uh, But somehow they were able to come up to him. And I've, I've pondered this and I've thought on this and just sat here with this. And I think, um, what we read in John's gospel that no one can come uh, unless the father draws him. So that truth, that goodness, that light, I'm certain is what uh, allowed those men to be able to come up to Jesus, allowed them to be able to follow him. And like I said, we don't know if they had friends that were helping or what, but something allowed these blind men to come. And and was it, um, you know, nowadays when I think about um, kind of our definition of blindness it, from the medical standpoint, uh, there are those who are legally blind who can see uh, lights and colors and shapes and can see uh, somewhat with glasses, uh, but without their glasses, they they are considered legally blind because they couldn't see to to drive or do other things. Um, or was it a distortion of their vision or was it complete darkness? It's hard to say since they were able to come up to him. We don't know, but that we know that they they could not see clearly. And um, in our verse for the day, it says, And when Jesus entered the house and the blind man came to him, Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Now, what was the this? What had they asked him? We only have recorded that they asked him to have mercy on them. 
in in that verse 27. We don't have recorded that they asked for their sight, but they did ask for mercy. And, oh, friends, that just strikes me as such an example of wanting God's will, knowing he's merciful, knowing he's gracious, knowing he's good, knowing he's loving, but knowing that whatever way he decides to be merciful, whatever way he decides to intervene will be the best way. And I I see that here. They said, have mercy on us, son of David. And, And before I go back to our verse for the day, when we see that son of David, that was a term uh, referring, it was kind of a messianic term, meaning referring to the Messiah. Um, Remember, David was a king in Israel and God had made a covenant with him and told him that there would never fail to be one who would sit uh, of his lineage, who would sit on the throne of Israel forever. And so when it was talked about that there would be a Messiah, he was talked about as the son of David. And when we look at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, How does it open up? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So um, they knew. They knew that he was this promised one. Um, And it was because it had been, um, they had been drawn to him, I'm convinced. But they asked for the Lord to have mercy. And then he didn't ask them here, do you believe that I'm able to give you sight? He says, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And what did they ask? They had asked for mercy. And they said to him, yes, Lord. I think they had heard how he had been merciful to others. Um, Now he had been merciful in in such a way that he had healed them and and, uh, raised the dead and done all these other wonderful things. Um, But I love this example that it wasn't a specific what they wanted. Now, there are some times that I think it's okay to ask for specifics. Um, and then we still, though, need to know that however God answers is the best way. And we can trust that. But what a wonderful, what a wonderful um, example. Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes saying, it shall be done for you according to your faith. It's important to remember here that because that old devil uh, and those who preach a false gospel that uh, if you uh, if you will it, it will happen. It is so important to remember and to see in this example, I think that uh, they were wanting Uh, They were just asking for mercy, and I suspect they were hoping that part of that mercy would include that they would receive their sight, Um, but they didn't specifically ask for that, and that's part of that asking. When we ask in faith, part of that that comes with maturity and, and knowing that God's will and His ways and His purposes and His plans are the very best for us is asking in such a way that we are going to trust and be thankful in whatever way He answers. And friends, that it's, it's hard to let go of our desires, but often when we do that, God does give us what we ask because we want his best. We want his will. We want his plan. And if we can change our mindset to not think, I want what I want. I want uh, want it this way, and this is the only way. And if I don't get it this way, then it's not going to be good enough. No, if we can trust the one who can see it all, who knows the best way, and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I do trust you. I'm asking for help with this. And if it, if you see fit and it's your will, perhaps this way, but if not, I trust you. Um, just like those, uh, oh, who was it? The, the three children who were in the fiery furnace, the three, uh, uh, children of Judah, those young men from Judah, Daniel's friends, who uh, told the king, uh, who was getting ready to throw him into the fiery furnace, you know, we believe, I'm paraphrasing this, we believe God can deliver us, but if he does not, 
we will still not bow the knee. I mean, they knew his will and his way was perfect. And I think we see that. And I think since their hearts were right when they said, yes, Lord, and they did believe that that is why Jesus said it shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were open. Now, sometime later, we may get into why uh, he said, don't tell anyone about this. And was it okay for them to tell him, even though he commanded them not to? Um, but uh, he knew sovereignly what all they would do and, and how people would act. But, oh, what a lesson for us uh, when they ask for mercy from a merciful, loving God. And, oh, he does show us mercy. He does show us mercy in and, and the most wonderful way. Um, the thing that matters more than anything is when uh, we ask him, knowing that we are sinners, to uh, forgive our sins, confessing that we are sinners, confessing that we need a Savior, confessing that we have no righteousness in on our own, um, and asking him to have mercy on us and to save us and to be our Savior. And he... He hears, he listens. You know, we read in Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 9. I'm going to back up. It says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, leading to righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, leading to salvation. It is a matter of the heart. And do we believe that he is merciful and he has what's best for us? Yes. And then he will answer it. And that is the most wonderful thing, the most wonderful gift. And we can believe him. We can trust him. We can trust what God's word says, that if we believe, if we confess, if we trust him, we will be saved. And friends, there's nothing better than that. Uh, but may we remember this when we're asking for all the other things that come across. Can we just remember that he is merciful? Can we believe and know that he is because we have seen it in our lives before? We've seen it in his word. We've seen it in the lives of other believers. And as we walk out this faith, um, Others will be able to see that in our lives, and it's a witness, an, ex an example. It's a light in this dark and dying world, and I think right now this is something I pray frequently for our country. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us. We are sinners. Uh, we deserve really what we're getting right now, but would you have mercy as this election cycle continues? Would you uh, keep us from the evil that is so prevalent? May we keep our hearts and minds stayed on you. Oh, friends, let us cry out to him and trust him. He is faithful. He is merciful. He does love us. Blessings to you until next time.